it's a remarkable, remarkable uh, statement. I strongly urge people that haven't heard it to, to listen to it. So anyway, the top leadership of the ANC, Mandela, Walter Sisulu, uh, Govan Mbeki, the father of Tawa Mbeki, uh, Dennis Goldberg. Dennis Goldberg was a European South Africa who was actually accused of setting up the first a guerrilla training camp within South Africa in a, in a farm. So he also was uh, convicted and sentenced with the top leaders of the ANC. So in 1963, many young South Africans, including Chris Hani, were smuggled out of the country and sent for military training in Tanzania. He was there for several months of training and then many of them were sent to the Soviet Union for additional training of over a year. And that's where, for the first time, they read up on the history of the Russian Revolution, which is something that was not taught in the schools in South Africa. When he came back to South Africa, by that time, Tanzania had set up many training camps for guerrillas, guerrilla training from uh, fighters from not only South Africa, but um, countries like what was then Rhodesia, uh, Mozambique, Angola, and the countries that were still dominated by European minorities. And in some of those farms, the guerrilla fighters actually started, uh, in some of those camps rather, the guerrilla fighters started farming because they were impressed with the President Julius Nyerere of Tanzania's philosophy of um, Ujama and self-reliance. So they produced their own food, they um, uh, went into livestock rearing, and basically uh, like a form of commercial agriculture, while of course still uh, learning uh, military strategy and uh, philosophy. So Chris Hani was in Tanzania for a short while, and then he was relocated to Zambia in 1965. Zambia had won its independence in 1964 under President uh, Kenneth Kaunda. Now, here's another curious part. <laughs> you know, the South African Communist Party and the ANC had a decades-long alliance uh, which lasted right through till the end of the apartheid uh, regime with the election of Mandela in 1994. But during that uh, early stage in the 60s, the governments of Tanzania under Nyerere and of Zambia under Kaunda wanted that alliance, the relationship to be downplayed. <laughs> I think they were probably feared the backlash uh, from, uh, from the, the West. And also philosophically, I understand that uh, Nyerere and Kaunda, who were both very religious Christians, Nyerere was a Catholic and Kaunda was a Presbyterian. So philosophically, they were not able to reconcile um, communism or Marxism-Leninism with their Christian faith, unlike uh, what uh, Chris Hani himself had been able to accomplish. So they were forced to downplay that alliance during those years. And of course they had no choice because they were being uh, accommodated by Tanzania and Zambia. So one of the other roles that Chris Hani had in Zambia was to, uh, he was a, a part of a committee that was organized to start infiltrating trained guerrilla fighters back into South Africa. He was also in charge of, uh, of hiding weapons that were brought from Tanzania into Zambia. And um, these young fighters were aching, you know, to get into the battlefield because they wanted to, to, to they're, they're fighting to be, uh, to be reported on so that 
people back in South Africa uh, would realize that the ANC, even though underground, even though the top leadership incarcerated, uh, was very much alive. So an opportunity to demonstrate that came in 1967 in an incident uh, called the Wanki Operation, W-A-N-K-I-E, and that's the name of a, um, a region in uh, what was then Rhodesia. And this was um, a special uh, combat operation that involved uh, the ANC's uh, uh, MK, Yom Kotan West Israel, together with fighters that were uh, the guerrilla fighters that belonged to the liberation movement of Joshua Nkomo, uh, Zapo, Zimbabwe African People's Union. Um, and the, the armed wing was called um, ZIPA, Zimbabwe People's Revolutionary Army. So um, the combined unit of the Omkonto with Sizwe and ZIPRA penetrated into uh, what was then Rhodesia, and they fought battles with the Rhodesian uh, military who got support from South Africans. And even though they were able to uh, to kill quite a few of the Rhodesian and South African soldiers, um, including um, a commander, they eventually were driven out. The uh, guerrillas were driven out and forced to uh, seek sanctuary in uh, Botswana, where they were arrested, and South Africa put tremendous pressure on uh, the government in Botswana, and they were imprisoned. They were given sentences of three to four years for weapons possession and illegal entry. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, Kaunda and Nyerere and Af other African leaders put a lot of pressure on Botswana, and eventually most of them were released after one year. So after that operation, Chris Honey became a lot more uh, critical of the of the ANC because he believed that the ANC and MK did not embrace that operation fully, did not acknowledge the sacrifices of those who died adequately, and did not study uh, the shortcomings. Uh, and the advantages of that operation to learn lessons for the future it became very critical after that. And it culminated in 1969 in him and other uh, compatriots writing a 3,000 word document, which has uh, subsequently became known as the Hani Memorandum or Chris Hani Memorandum. He was a co-author, he was not the sole author, you know, and uh, some of the critique was that a lot of the leaders of the ANC in exile were no longer professional revolutionaries, but had become professional businessmen, um, jet-setting middle class. Um, they were not willing to take uh, uh, criticism. They were not embracing the need for political education uh, for effective mobilization and uh, many other observations and uh, also they need to have a, um, a national uh, conference even in exile and um, they distributed these uh, the document to uh, the key supporters of the uh, ANC many foreign embassies including uh, the Soviet Union, including the People's Republic of China. So the ANC leadership um, took this very seriously and actually overreacted. Uh, there were demands that uh, Chris Hani and his associates be tried, convicted, and executed. Um, that was uh, another uh, uh, criticism that Tani had of the ANC in Quanto with Caesar. 
of, uh, of uh, rush trials and executions uh, of uh, members of Um Kwanto Wesizwe, particularly in those uh, camps uh, where the guerrillas trained and, uh, and, and were housed. So uh, it took the intervention of Oliver Tambo, who in the many years of exile was the acting president of the ANC while Mandela was incarcerated. Uh, but ultimately they were expelled from the party in 1969, Chris Hani and some associates, although later on they were invited back and rejoined the party. And ironically, one of their main suggestions of a national uh, conference was actually adopted. And the conference was held in, in Tanzania, in Morogoro. Uh, but the, uh, they, they, they did not adopt immediately the call for uh, enhanced political education for effective mobilization. That did not happen until after 1978, after Joe Slovo, Oliver Tambo, and uh, Joe Morise, who was a, um, a, a leader, uh, actually the uh, commander of the army of the Amkonto um, uh, we After they visited Vietnam and met, you know, the great general, General Yap, G-I-A-P, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, the hero of uh, Dien Van Phu, the hero of the many battles that ultimately saw uh, the defeat of the United States in Vietnam. And um, he basically spoke the same language, the importance of political education for effective mobilization. Only then did the ANC start taking that very seriously, something they could have uh, done in uh, 1969 had they followed many of the recommendations in the, the Chris Hani memo. Uh, so uh, in the 1970s, because now we're into the 1970s, Chris Hani uh, did a lot of uh, diplomatic travel around the world to mobilize support for the ANC. He traveled under aliases, of course. And then in 1974, Chris Hani and Joe Slovo and other leaders of uh, Umkonto uh, were trained in uh, East Germany because at that time they were really getting serious about penetrating back into South Africa, um, underground of course. And there's a, there's a funny uh, episode there too that um, they wanted to Chris Hani to infiltrate on a bicycle. Um, and, but then at one point during that training in East Germany, I understand he had to uh, admit that he had never actually learned how to ride a bicycle. <laughs> so he took a crash course to that as well. So then in 1975, he um, penetrates back into South Africa for a brief while because South Africa had serious uh, there were serious consequences for people who were caught harboring what South Africans refer to as terrorists, meaning the ANC. Uh, all those parties have been banned. So you had to be moving from one place to another place, and eventually was no longer safe, so he uh, went back to uh, Lesotho, where his uh, parents had also uh, uh, moved into exile. Um, and at one point, I mean, he survived many assassination attempts, particularly when he was uh, uh, in uh, Lesotho. Uh, him and his wife, Limfo, uh, including attempted car bombings. Uh, so they alternated living between Lesotho and Zambia, just to always to be try to keep one pace ahead of the South African assassins, you know. Um, and then in the 1980s, 
things began to change uh, dramatically in South Africa. The um, UDF was formed, United Democratic uh, 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 Forces. And that was a umbrella alliance that brought together hundreds of um, activists, liberation uh, groups, uh, church organizations, all mobilizing protests and nonviolent uh, resistance against the apartheid regime. A lot of protests, a lot of demonstrations, a lot of uh, uh, industrial acts um, in South Africa. So the regime began to really weaken significantly, so much so that by 1985, Anglo-American, that huge uh, uh, company that dominates the uh, diamond and gold industry, reached out and actually sent its uh, chairman to meet with uh, ANC leadership in, in Zambia including uh, um, uh, Chris Fani. So that was a sign that things were beginning to change dramatically in South Africa. And the ANC had also carried out some uh, major bombing operations, particularly in 1983, when they, um, the so-called Church Street bombing, yes, they had their own version, but in a very different way, of course. This was, um, the ANC set off a huge bomb outside an office that had been, that was rented by the South African Air Force. And uh, it killed 27 people and wounded um, well more than 100. And this was in retaliation for 1982 when South Africa sent a commando force to Lesotho that killed as uh, many as 42 ANC members, leaders, as well as supporters. And also, uh, partly as revenge for the, uh, for the assassination of Ruth First. So I think the South African authorities were beginning to feel uh, that the ANC was capable of taking major um, guerrilla operations within South Africa. But of course, things changed even much more dramatically in 1987 with the Battle of Quito Quanavam in uh, Angola, when South Africa had sent a major expeditionary force, large part of his army, supporting uh, UNITA, UNITA led by Jonas Savimbi the CIA and United States supported um, guerrilla leader, seen as a puppet of the West and South Africa, uh, to fight against the, um, the government of the MPLA in Angola, which was supported by the Soviet Union and Cuba. But it was because of Cuban forces that they prevailed at Quito Panaval. At one point, you know, Castro had been supporting the MPLA since 1975 with massive, you know, interventions, but the Soviet Union was trying to repair relations with the United States. Uh, the Soviet Union was actually uh, about to collapse a few years later. So they wanted Cuba to tone down its support for the MPLA. Um, and they insisted that Soviet military advisors uh, take control of the war effort against the UNITA and the South African Army. And after one major battle where Angola lost 2,000 soldiers, then Castro just intervened and said, listen, you're about to be annihilated. Let me take command. And Castro did and sent tens of thousands, 
sent tens of thousands of Cuban soldiers, artillery pieces, anti-aircraft to Angola. And he personally, and this is according to the chief of staff of the South African Army, that Castro personally uh, commanded the, uh, the war effort by telephone in Havana. And ultimately, of course, that led to the decisive defeat of South Africa uh, in March 1988, led to the withdrawal of South Africans uh, from Angola and from Namibia, which won its independence in 1990, led to the release of Nelson Mandela in 1990, and the beginning of the negotiations to end the apartheid regime. And as I observed in the beginning, um, Chris Hani was actually regarded as not too enthusiastic about those negotiations. And uh, it's widely believed that he um, was convinced that the armed struggle all the way to the end would have been a better solution. But in August 1990, the ANC suspended uh, the armed struggle uh, without consulting Chris Hani. Uh, because uh, obviously Mandela and the other leaders knew that Hani opposed uh, the suspension of armed struggle, certainly not before the end of the apartheid regime. Um, and this is where you start to now ask questions. You know, what if Chris Hani had actually lived and not been killed so prematurely? What kind of South Africa would we have today? You know, uh, the South Africa that we have today is the South Africa that Steve Biko warned against, that replacing Europeans with African leaders is not sufficient. We have to change the total system of ownership of the means of production, the system of production. Um, obviously, after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know, socialists, uh, uh, Marxists, were on the defensive. But Chris Hani's position was that, yes, uh, the Soviet system was totalitarian. Yes, the Soviet system lacked democracy. But that, in of itself, is not sufficient to indict or to repudiate socialism, you know? So uh, the South African Communist Party and Chris Hani succeeded um, um, Joe Slovo as the Secretary General um, started talking about democratic socialism and actually wanted to adopt that as part of its official platform but it was uh, voted out down that did not carry the day, even though Chris Hani and Joe Slovo supported that. But um, he was such a popular and dynamic and charismatic, charismatic individual that the party membership, the South African Communist Party, increased from less than 1,000 members, these are official members, in 1990 to more than 25,000 a year later in 1991, see? So the party was growing tremendously and he wanted it to grow as an independent entity. Um, uh, many of the members that had dual uh, uh, membership, uh, South African Communist Party and ANC, many of the ANC uh, members had uh, actually withdrawn or left their membership in the South African Communist Party but uh, Chris Hani was determined to build it into a huge independent entity. Uh, so then we have the negotiations uh, coming to its fruition, but Chris Hani did not live to see that day. Uh, 1993, uh, in April, he was uh, assassinated by uh, uh, Janus uh, Wallace did not live to see the formal end of apartheid. But I think he had made his 
own position known, he would not have been the, the kind of uh, uh, individual to support the so-called black empowerment uh, program that basically enriched a small black elite. People like uh, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, who is today's president of South Africa, and is uh, a billionaire uh, in U.S. dollars, right? While the plight of the South African masses uh, has not been addressed. Uh, Chris Hani believed in grassroots democracy. He wanted to empower young South Africans and provide them with skills. He wanted to democratize beginning at the grassroots he felt like some of the rural chiefs had too much power and sometimes vetoed um, good policies that other people uh, came up with. So he wanted that system democratized as well. And he also said that he had not abandoned some form of nationalization of the major uh, resources and means of production, but that what he wanted was a new form of worker-controlled uh, production system. And he obviously never had the opportunity to articulate uh, that vision. He said what he wanted to avoid was bureaucratic structures, because he had seen what that had done in the, um, in the Soviet Union. So that, in part, is uh, uh, Chris Hani. Obviously, there's a lot more to the man, but I think this should be a, um, a good summary, and um, I strongly recommend this book, uh, Chris Hani by Hugh Macmillan. It's a very good starter for anybody that wants to find out more about uh, the life and times of this great South African, struck to Ali, just like Steve Biko was also struck too early, and they shared that vision of the South Africa that would definitely be a much more effective state than what we have today, which is the classic outpost of capitalism, just like most African countries sadly are. So that concludes episode number 46. I want to have one more episode before the end of the year. So that would be sometime next week. And I look forward to continuing uh, to share with you these aspects of Africa's history. So we can understand the African condition of today and hopefully envision a better Africa for tomorrow. Thank you, sisters and brothers. Thank you, friends.